We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens His will to make known. The weak and oppressing now cease from distressing. Sing praises to His name, He forgets not His own. Sing praises to His name, He forgets not His own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining His kingdom divine. So from the beginning the fight we were winning, the Lord we're at our side, O oh, glory be thine. The Lord we're at our side, O oh, glory be thine. We all do extol thee, thou leader triumphant, and pray that thou still a defender wilt be. Let thy congregation escape the tribulation. Thy name be ever praised, O Lord, make us free. Thy name be ever praised, O Lord, make us free. Let us pray. Almighty God, I pray that we will have that sense of gathering together, of being with one another, if not in the flesh, in spirit, and even more than in spirit, as we look on one another's faces and hear one another's voices and commune with one another and experience this feeling that we get when we participate together in the body of Christ, sharing our loves and our joys and our heartache and our prayers and all of those things. We ask that your spirit meet us in this space and that you tell us more about ourselves than we knew before we came here so that we might better resemble your life, your love, and the life of Jesus Christ. Amen. So as you're unmuting yourself, I'll go quickly over the uh, announcements and housekeeping issues. Uh, as you know, Bible course Wednesday at two o'clock, we'll be going over Genesis chapter 20 this week, Wednesday at two o'clock. Also continued requests for Christmas trees and lights. Some, several of you have reached out to me and graciously uh, offered up so spare uh, false fake Christmas tree and um, lights and I'm beginning to be able to take something like an inventory of what we're working with so that I can begin to plan the layout of what it'll look like and even begin put to, putting together those trees. I remind you that today is the first Sunday of two where we'll be taking special Thanksgiving Day offerings. Uh, those, these offerings are specifically for students at, at our Disciples of Christ colleges, universities, and seminaries. And it's my understanding that some of you have already even sent in um, donations towards that offering. And thank you very much. Also, you will be receiving this week your yearly pledge card. It's about three weeks later than usual, um, given the ebb and flow of this year's calendar. It's been hard to uh, keep things more down to normal days and normal dates. So um, that accounts for it being later than, than usual. And so I encourage you, once you receive the pledge card, to prayerfully and thoughtfully fill it out and mail it back to us as soon as possible so that we can begin to estimate what our uh, expected givings will be in, in the coming year. And so keep, keep, uh, keep an eye out for that card in the mail. Are there um, any other joys or concerns or announcements or things that we need to be thinking about? Yes, I have a friend, very good friend, that found out in October that she has <coughs> breast cancer and she's having surgery this morning. So okay. let us uh, pray for her. Her name is Pearl Carter. Pearl Carter. How you doing, Jen? <coughs> How's Jan doing? Mm -hmm. as, far as, as far as I know, she's okay. She was looking at the possibility of going to take care of her daughter in Atlanta. 
she was going to be driving and she was supposed to let me know if she was going to be going or not. So I'm not sure. But she is doing, she must be quite a bit better. Yes. Yeah. She, she never Probably. got, she never got very sick. She had a few days where she felt tired and a bit, you know, like she had a cold or something like that. Um, but most of the time she was spent um, quarantined feeling fairly okay and, and, and really um, fairly positive and optimistic. So I'm not surprised that she's ready to um, go out and about again. How's your daughter, Connie? She's just fine. Okay. She had a, she had a tumble on her bike and got some uh, road rash, but uh, that's healing up and going through all those various colors of bruising. And, uh, but, it, but she's, she's doing well. I'll tell her you asked. Thank you. Catalina, did uh, you guys go through the typhoons okay? Um, it's in Luzon, it's in Manila, but okay. here in Mindanao, we're not affected. So that's quite a ways off. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> It is, I know we've said it before, but it's remarkable that we are in this room, people are represented from California, Colorado, and the Philippines. <laughs> it surely is. I have a concern uh, about the spread of the virus. Um, mm. If we get to the level 10 in Fishers, I will not be able to go see Jack. Mm. And it's at nine something now, I think there. Mm. Oh man. How is Jack doing, Janet? Well, he's hanging in there. He fell and uh, got a big goose egg on his head and ended up in the hospital and Aww. was released and there was no problem. But he's going through the various stages of color <laughs> through his eye as well. How's the wrist, Jean? How's your wrist after the surgery? It's oh. it's it's coming. I have uh, next Friday. I see the surgeon. Okay. You know, it's just going through its stages too. <laughs> <laughs> it would rather really rather stay straight than bend. <laughs> mm, I bet. bet. I went and got a sack of rice and I'm just in a, and I put it in a bowl. I bought five pounds of rice and I try to use that about 15 minutes, three times a day. And I think my own PT is working a little better. <laughs> you shared with me last week that what do you your do with physical, the rice? <laughs> physical therapist uh, has certain expectations for where she'd like to see her wrist in terms of mobility that, um, perhaps her being young, young and naive, like beyond what you had before you broke your wrist, I guess. Yes. <laughs> Which is a funny position to be in, to try to convince somebody that you know something about your own physical self that maybe they're just guessing at. Say hello. Well, I well, got a diagnosis of um, carpal tunnel in both hands. Oh. Moderate to severe. So I've got. I'm wearing my gloves all day long to keep my hands warm. <laughs> and the splint at night. Oh. Oh. <laughs> That's a, oh, I, the splint makes it feel so much better. Yes, it does. Yeah. But you know, with corporal tunnel, if you <clears throat> this was, the rice was recommended for wrist fractures and corporal tunnel. I'll, I'll give you a call and ask you about that. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all for your for your sharing. Is there anyone else who has anything uh, they'd like to, to raise up? Oh, if not, we'll, we'll move into a time of prayer and then um, sermon, song, communion, and then I'll see you on the other, other side of all of those things. So I'm gonna go ahead and mute everybody and ask that you remain muted until, um, 
until we're done with with communion. Let us pray. Gracious God, in love you created us, and in love you sustain us day after day. So it is with confidence that we bring our prayers to you, knowing that you hear us and will respond. We bring up Pearl, who is having surgery for her breast cancer today. We bring up Jack and Janet, and as they are uh, hopefully not facing the, po the possibility of, of, of prolonged um, time where they will be able to see one another. God, we pray that you will, will make a way for them to, to be together. Uh, we pray for continued healing for, for Jean and her wrist. And we pray for all of those here in our Northwood um, bubble who are not well in body or mind or spirit. I pray that you will bring a healing presence into their lives and will uh, bring them to a place of, of calm and peace and wholeness. We pray for those around us in the world, for the many who continue to suffer and call out for help, for those without enough to eat, for those who are caught up in violence and political uprisings, for those picking up the pieces after natural disasters, for those desperate to find work to support their families. We pray, God, for those who are our enemies. You've called us to pray for our enemies, to bless rather than curse those who deliberately seek us harm. We bring their names before you now those who have hurt us physically or emotionally, those who have stolen from us or cheated us of what was rightfully ours, those who have spread rumors about us or turned our friends against us, we ask you to bless them. Open our hearts so that we may see them as you see them and be able to respond to them with your love. We pray for your church around the world that it would be a living demonstration of your coming kingdom, offering hospitality to all ready to help in times of need, showing love to friends and families alike, seeking to live in peace with all. God, we praise you for your faithful love and for the mercy you have shown us. Open our eyes to recognize your presence in our lives. Give us grace to hear your call and courage to follow without hesitation, knowing that your way is the only way that leads to life. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray these things. Amen. We now pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hello, if you have been tuning in in recent weeks, then you will know that I have begun these videos of late with this disclaimer. You may hear the sound of children playing outside my office. There are a couple of schools that are in session and they're spending as much time outdoors as possible during this pandemic for safety reasons. And so they will be playing, they will be shouting, and you may hear some of that in the background. I apologize in advance if it is a distraction to you and I hope that it actually brings you some amount of joy to hear children at play as it does me. All of that being said, all distractions aside, I'd like to introduce our text for today, which is Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And it goes, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, there, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. I have become convinced that we spend so much of our life 
discovering the beauty and the priceless treasure that is there just underneath our noses. And if we don't spend most of our life discovering that treasure, we spend much of our life ignoring it or missing it. And it is a shame. Just a few weeks ago in our midweek Bible study, we considered a story in which Abraham played host to not only divine beings, but to God. And he didn't know it, but he treated these divine beings to a sumptuous feast, only to discover that he had been playing host to God and God's servants the entire time. And he learned that you might just be entertaining angels. As a matter of fact, we believe that behind every person, in the face of every person, and behind the eyes of every person, we see an image of God. We are always, in one way or another, entertaining divine persons. So we should be very careful and even deferential when we speak to others. You never know if you are trespassing on holy ground when you mistreat another. Today's story is a story about a man who did not know that he was, of all things, standing on holy ground. He was guarding sheep. Guarding sheep on holy ground. Just a normal day for Moses. He was making sure his father-in-law's flock was well kept. It was the busy work that you and I try to make interesting, keeping your mind occupied with various thoughts or reflections. Who knows what he was daydreaming about? This is the headspace he was probably in. Think about the headspace that you are in when you are doing something mundane, not expecting anything extraordinary to happen. Then he looks up. And he sees that a bush is on fire. But the interesting thing about the bush was that it was on fire, but not burning up. Very odd. In fact, as I said, extraordinary. So Moses tables his to-do list. He probably just leaves the sheep to their own devices. And he goes and checks out this site. And he approaches, and then God speaks to him from the bush and calls him by name. Moses acknowledges this, and then God says, Come no closer, remove your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. What seemed before to be plain old dirt and dry rocks is called holy ground. The mundane is elevated and given importance and significance He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So it's just a normal day, as I've been saying, you know, just normal space, except Moses discovered that beneath the mundane was the astonishing, the beautiful, the powerful. Makes you wonder what it is that we miss. What, are, what am I missing right now? What are you missing right now? And in recent weeks, we've been talking about the things that we miss, the things that we fail to acknowledge. More specifically, we've been talking about currencies, various gifts and possessions that the community has to share with the world that it misses when it only focuses on currency as money. Eric Law, in his book, Holy Currencies, writes that various currencies in Church, in churches, the, the currencies that we possess must be noticed, acknowledged, named, and they must flow. They must be shared with the community and then those outside of it. Otherwise, they are lost. They stagnate. Relationships never deepen. Truths are never named. Talents and strengths are lost or never put to good use. Today, we're going to talk about what happens when holy places, holy places are never noticed. What happens when Moses fails, or if he had failed, what would have happened if he had failed to see the divine in the mundane? Moses noticed a holy place. Now, before I continue, I should acknowledge that he had a bit of an advantage in his case. After all, the bush was burning. I think that that might catch just about anyone's attention. He'd have been pretty thick to have missed it. But I'm wondering if we aren't missing holy places around us all the time. Some places are obviously holy, as noticeable as that burning bush. For example, our sanctuary here at Northwood Christian Church. 
And boy, don't we know that it is a holy place in the context of this pandemic. We miss it deeply. I can hardly walk through it when I walk into my office. I sometimes will go into the sanctuary and just take stock of the room, breathe in the room. And it makes me sad because I miss you in it because that is the holy place where we gather and we notice one another in that holy place. So we want to return to that place because it's a sacred place, as obvious to us as a burning bush. To return to that place where we have felt the same impulse that Moses had to take off his sandals because he was on holy ground. This translates today as don't run in the sanctuary. Don't speak loudly in the sanctuary when you are not supposed to. Don't eat in the sanctuary. And yes, I am reliving my childhood at this point. I remember older ladies getting upset at me when I was a kid for sitting with my shoes on the pew in the sanctuary because this was disrespectful. It was to not acknowledge and notice the place that I would discover to be holy. And then I used to roll my eyes. and It annoyed me. I did not understand back then that they were in their own way trying to differentiate between that holy space and all the other spaces. Today, I'm wanting to challenge the barriers that we create between holy places and the places that we erroneously think of as mundane. I think that the holy places are all around us, that we, like Moses, are very near, if not right on top of holy ground all the time. But these spaces are wasted if they are not noticed. Let's start with the room that you are now sitting in. If you're watching this, you may be thinking that this is a poor substitute for the real thing, the sanctuary, the singing, and everything else that goes on in church. And you may be right. Uh, for some people, I think that is certainly right. Others seem to appreciate this digital discourse. I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I like both for different reasons, but many of us feel this a very poor substitute. And as a matter of fact, I will say yes, this is not as good as seeing you face to face, flesh to flesh, handshakes and hugs. So you are not in the sanctuary. You're not in the place that you have already determined to be holy because it is. You are in your kitchen or your bedroom or your living room. You may be sitting or standing. Where? I challenge you. Think of it this way. How if you are now in this moment sitting, standing, occupying a space that is sacred, holy ground. In fact, you are, if only you have the eyes to see it. And what is a holy space? It's a space that is a conduit between you and the divine, you and God and God's love and knowledge and wisdom about God. And that space for you today, right now, that holy space is where you are. You who are made in God's image. You just need the eyes to see it. And we desperately need the eyes to see it in this hopefully brief era of digital worship. I'm remembering Jesus's conversation with the Samaritan woman that he met at the well. And he said something there that is astonishing, but very relevant to the moment in time we find ourselves in today. After she told Jesus about the physical space, the mountain her ancestors had set aside for worship. Jesus responded, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He went on to say, The hour is coming and it is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. He is hinting at a time. He's more than hinting at a time. He is prophesying into the ether a time that he said was then and is still now. When people will realize that you don't need to gather at a specific mountain to encounter God, that God's spirit will find us when we turn to find it. 
Which means right now in your humble home where you are watching this, God is there. God is with you. Do not miss the fact that you are now on holy ground. This space is holy. And it gives me chills to think about it. So I miss the sanctuary as much as many of you, but do not miss what is right beneath you. Holy ground is made holy, I believe, by the presence of God. And the presence of God is where those made in God's image reside. Church buildings and church properties are said to be holy ground, and I'm not disputing this. In fact, I believe that certain spaces are rendered more sacred by their designation. So I'm starting to respect more and more the sentiment of those women who in my youth and childhood would tell me to keep my feet off of the pews in the sanctuary. But one thing I notice in churches are empty rooms, classrooms that no longer serve as meeting spaces for congregants. But we don't want to change them because we have thought of them as holy in a very distinct and specific way set back decades. Fellowship halls that sit with no one gathering in them, just the memories of what happened there when they were used. One of the rooms that stood out to me when I first visited Northwood and first came to Northwood and began to walk around the building on my own was the choir room on the third floor. By the time I arrived, there were congregants who could not gather in that space because it was inaccessible because there's no elevator access to the third floor. But with an elevator, even, there's no choir. And so it is a room that is haunted. My main problem with the room is not that, it's not that there's no access to it, although I wish there was access to every room for all persons in our building, something we should be thinking about. But... The real problem with that room is that it's haunted, not by ghosts, but by memories of its past. Let me explain. There sits on shelves stacks and stacks of board games, or there did at the time when I first got here. Stacks and stacks of board games that were presumably once played by people decades ago now gathering dust. A ping pong table that sat there gathering dust. There stood in the corner shelves and shelves of trinkets and objects that had been relegated there over the years as the choir room became more and more of a storage closet than anything else. Choir robes gathering dust. Like I said, haunted. It was like the bedroom of a child that has moved out and the parent cannot change a thing about it because they are haunted by the memories blessed by the memories, but also stuck in the memories. At least that's how that room seemed to me, not having had those powerful feelings for that room, not having shared that space in the ways that it had been shared with others in the past. So many good memories made in that room. And when I first arrived at Northwood, many of you would describe to me what it was like to practice in that room, to put on the choir robes and sing songs together. Beautiful, beautiful memories. You spoke as if the room were still alive and kept in more than memory, a fact that stood rebuked by the reality. Because when I made my way upstairs and entered into that space, what I found was a fine room but empty and void of life. Sure, echoes of the past were reverberating off the walls, but the space was hollow. Can a space be sacred without life? Can a room be holy without holy persons mm -hmm. living life, creating life, creating beauty inside? Mm -hmm. Is a sanctuary sacred without people? Is a choir room sacred without its singers? Every empty space has potential. If we are to think of our spaces, the physical locations that Northwood owns as currency, then we must find ways to let the currencies flow. And so now I'm really talking specifically about this currency of place. Eric Law writes of this currency. 
Currency of place refers to the properties from which your church slash ministry operates and other properties owned by or which can be accessed by your church or ministry. He goes on. If a church only uses the building a few hours a week for worship and the building is locked the rest of the week, this church is not maximizing its currency of place. He concludes, in order to maximize the currency of place, we need to invest our currency of both time, both paid and volunteer workers, in making the place flow with activities that are exchanged for other currencies, such as those of gracious leadership, relationship, truth, wellness, and eventually money. I emphasize, Heath Jones here, emphasizes eventually money because the raising of money to sustain a building only matters if that space is truly reclaimed as holy ground. And this is in part what is happening at Northwood. You may already know this, but our space is being used by a variety of groups. We lease the space out to art studios, schools, choirs, and even other churches. And if you were to go up to that old choir room these days, you discover that it is no longer haunted. In fact, look at it. These are the pictures of what is happening there now. It is filled with life-giving activity. Children are honing their skills at pottery, they are creating art out of glass. This is more than a start. Now the currency of space is beginning to flow. But here's where even more work comes in. Eric Law is right to point out that unless we, the church people, invest our time in these sacred places. The currency of place does not come back around to feed us. I would suspect that many of you did not know that our choir room was being used in this way. And so how has the currency of place beginning to flow come back around to feed us? us? In other words, whilst the wonderful work of our tenants is a blessing to those who participate, it has hardly an impact on Northwood, the church, the people in the church, unless we invest our currency of time in these endeavors. And so here's where we have to connect our time in this space with the time of others who are occupying this space. And we started to do just this last year. You may remember the open house that we hosted. All of our tenants put their best foots forward and we opened up their spaces to the public to showcase what they do and I really wanted to bring in members from our church to see what's going on in this building from Monday through Saturday. And many of our ch church members made their way up to the third floor for the first time in years. And we were amazed to discover the richness uncovered, the spaces that have be been reclaimed as holy in our building as they are filled with God's children. Then there was Global Fest, the festival that we hosted on behalf of IPS School 70. Thousands of people trafficked our property. This space was again reclaimed on a Saturday as holy space being trafficked by people who are made in God's image. And if you were here, it was amazing. And Northwood, of course, had a presence. We, we passed out information about our church and we, we met new people and we passed out coffee. And we will host them for years to come. That relationship between us and that school just across the street is deepening. So that brings us back to last week where we talk about the currency of relationships. They all work together. Unfortunately, the pandemic has in many ways curtailed our abilities to deepen the relationships that have begun to develop through our planning events like the Open House or Global Fest. And in the future, we hope to pick up where we left off and now we're even trying to find creative ways to make these connections. In the meantime, what sacred spaces might we discover at Northwood or think about in new and creative ways? There are obvious examples. One is that every Saturday, our parking lot becomes a sacred place. Holy ground 
It becomes holy when it serves this as the staging area for the feeding of the hungry. The high priests are the volunteers that carry bags of groceries to the cars for those who have need. But what else are we missing? Well, our church grounds will become holy yet again on Christmas Eve. Even though we will be outside and in our cars, the, the parking lot will be holy as we host a Christmas Eve service open to the public. And I hope primarily attended by those we've yet to meet. But looking even further into the future, what then when we are back in our building as usual, and that time will come, I just got hung up on those last words, per usual. When we are back in our building per usual, we must not get hung up on the per usual. How might we use our currency of space and time and cause it to flow in new ways? The past does not repeat itself. We must look into the future and how can we connect what happens these days, in the choir room, even today, I saw the teacher going up to the classroom today. What can we do to connect what happens in there that is life-giving and holy these days with the community at Northwood? How might the holy work of our preschools impact the holy work of Northwood's gospel mission? Yes, I'm inviting you into a brainstorming session that you can think about and call me about later this week. Here's where we must circle back to the conversation that we had two weeks ago about the currency of relationships, and I alluded to this just a second ago. We are going to have to get to know our neighbors, our neighbors that are in this building, and develop true and honest relationships with them, with our tenants and those who they serve. And as we do, we will discover the treasure trove of currency that is our building and property and the ways in which they're flowing, sourcing new and wonderful life. It does not always have to have Northwood Christian Church's brand to be a benefit to Northwood Christian Church. But the currency of space has to flow. No room should sit empty, haunted by its past. This week, the Leadership Council began a very exciting conversation about the ways we might utilize the property during the pandemic. I mean, why pay for landscaping if we aren't even walking on the property? So we're beginning to envision outdoor events for the public so that we may share our space with the community and thus reclaiming it as holy. The Christmas Eve service is more than a start, but how about another Christmas event? And this, the ideas for this are just germinating and need to get off the ground quickly because we are about a month in a week away from Christmas? One person on the council suggested something as simple as cookies. We could pull that off. How if we set up some Christmas version of Trunk or Treat where instead of handing out Halloween candy, we passed out cookies that we've made and then invited others in the community to invite, to share their cookies, their goodness, this goodness with the community to gather in a safe way during the pandemic, meeting out on the sidewalk at different stations, an opportunity that has been all too rare these days, that is an opportunity to meet with one's neighbors, to connect with one's neighbors. So I'm trying to paint a picture of how this might look. It's not some abstraction. It really happens when you put in the time in the place to deepen the relationships and the currency of relationships and truth telling and all the things that we've been talking about and will continue to talk about the currency of space and the currency of our time flowing. The very sidewalks around our building become holy ground as they are trafficked by those who are made in God's image. Our parking lot, every closet, each space in our facility has the potential to become sacred once again, or for us to discover that it is even now sacred space and holy ground. But we have to let that space, the currency of that space flow. We cannot let quiet room, choir rooms become storage closets or classrooms become gathering space for dust bunnies. We've got to let our currency of place flow. And we are starting it and we are doing it, but there is more to come. We just need to connect some of the dots, connecting the life that happens in our building with the life that happens at Northwood Christian Church on usual Sundays. And here we circle back to the currency of relationships. You see how it's all connected. 
So the next time you enter into our building, you might have to fight the impulse to take off your shoes. You may hear a subtle voice from your depths. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I hope you can hear this echo, this voice, where you sit right now, as you reclaim where you are sitting as holy space. You might even, the next time you come here, have to fight the impulse to hide your face as you grapple with this reality that in this holy sacred place that we call Northwood, you have been presented with the opportunity to look on the face of God. After all, do we not see in one another the very image of God? This may happen even on this holy ground that we call Northwood Christian Church. Let the treasure of this space flow. Sometimes towards the end or during the song, begin to reflect on the words that I will say uh, before communion. And the idea is that if I find the right words, this moment, this time in our, our service will feel holy. That the sense that God is meeting us as we commune with one another by way of these elements, taking from the bread or drinking of the cup, that uh, we will taste the kingdom of God coming into our very presence. And as I was reflecting on communion in light of the story of Moses that we just heard about, I'm wondering if it's not about the words or if there really are words that can cultivate that sense, but rather maybe it is just an awareness and opening of our eyes to the fact that whatever we say here, whatever we do here, when we look on one another and take communion, this is a holy moment. We just need to have the eyes to see it. The eyes to see it. It is holy because I am here with you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, partaking in this meal that millions, billions of people this very Sunday are sharing all over the globe and have done for these past 2,000 years. It's an amazing thing. We do it because Jesus told us to do it. He said one evening when he was having dinner with his friends, his disciples, he took bread and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and he passed it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is being broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it and he poured it out to his disciples saying, this is my blood, which is being shed for the forgiveness of your sins. The cup of the new covenant, take and drink in remembrance of me. For as often as we take of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he returns.
where I'm going to play a song that Sharon has recorded this week, a song of sending, and I'll see you on, on the other side of that song. God be with you till we meet again. Go in the grace of God and in the name of Jesus into the world, sharing God's love until next time. And before we go, I will again remind you, encourage you to um, look out for the pledge cards in the mail. They'll be coming and um, don't miss those. And if you don't receive one, just let us know so we can get those out to you. You can all unmute yourselves and say, uh, and say goodbye to one another. Everybody have a good week. You too, Connie. Yeah, you too, Connie. I, yeah. I'm going to go. We're getting ready to have a Skype call with my son and daughter-in-law. So I'm pretty excited about that. So. Oh, good. 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 Well, take good. care of yourself. Thanks. See you Wednesday. See you Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Bye, Judith. Bye. It was good to see everybody. Have a good yeah. week. Take it was yeah. good to see you, Shirley. Take Thank care. You. Take care. Blessed right. week, everybody. Blessed week. Bye. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. Oh.